All right, so over the last six hours, you have heard presentations on topics ranging from passion and purpose to prima donnas. You heard topics about submarines and saying yes. And you also heard topics on uh, working less and waking up in a hospital with burn marks on your chest and smelling like bacon. <laughs> We've covered a lot of topics. And I'll be honest with you, the, my Danish is limited to what I can order off the menu in a restaurant. So I didn't actually understand what was being said today. And what I want to try to do is maybe tie it all together, though, because I had a chance to talk with many of the speakers before I came here today. And I want to tie it together in a conversation around something that is of a passion of mine, which is I will call about speeding your success. Speeding your success is what we're going to cover. And I want to talk about this in two different pieces. So there's the speed aspect, and there's the success aspect. And I want to start off with the speed aspect of this conversation. And to do that, we're actually not going to talk about it, we're going to do an experiment. We're going to do an experiment with all of you here, and this is where I need my helpful assistants to start passing out pieces of paper. To do this experiment, every person in the room needs a sheet of paper. If you're using the little pieces of paper like these, you probably want two of them. And uh, you need a pen. You can't do this on an iPad, so don't even bother attempting it. Here's how it's going to work. We're going to do an experiment that was developed by a colleague of mine by the name of Scott Halford. He's a neurobehaviorist. And what he studies is the brain and how the brain functions impact our behaviors. So we're actually going to do a competition right now. End of the day, it's hot in the room. So we're going to do a competition. That's always fun. And the competition that we're going to do is to see how fast your brain is operating right now. I guess the question I have for you is who is convinced that they have the fastest brain in the room? Who thinks they've got the fastest brain? <laughs> yes, good. Okay, we got a couple people. We've got a competition going. Here's how it's going to work. Everybody needs a sheet of paper and a pen. What I have up here in my folder is a sheet of paper. And on that sheet of paper is a long list of numbers. I'm going to read these numbers to you in rapid fire fashion. I will sound like an auctioneer. Your goal is to write down as many of the numbers as you possibly can. Knowing that having done this with tens of thousands of people, not one person has yet gotten all of them correct. But hey, there's always a first. The reason why it's so difficult is, like in real life, you can't just lock yourself in a room, close the door, shut off the phone, turn off your email. I mean, that's just, it's not how it works. We get interrupted. So I'm going to interrupt your thought patterns. I'm going to read you a bunch of numbers, and then I will give you a command. And with that command, you need to write something down. And to be deemed as having a fast brain, you have to write down an appropriate response to the command. I'll give you more numbers, another command. We'll do this a few times. The person who gets the most numbers correct and writes down an appropriate response to each of the commands will be deemed as having the fastest brain in the room. <laughs> Very simple. All right. Once I get started, I can't stop, so I'm going to get a glass of water. Get your pens ready. Forty-seven, eighty-eight, three hundred and sixty-two, fifty-five, one thousand eight hundred and twenty-two, forty-nine, thirty-six, fifty-five, three hundred and twenty-seven, nineteen, eighteen, ten, forty, sixty, eighty, thirty, four hundred and seventy-two, one thousand six hundred and eighty-eight. Write down a color: seven hundred and fifty-six, five hundred and twenty-two, thirty-seven, four hundred and thirty-three, six hundred and ninety-nine, seven hundred and eighty-eight, thirty-six, twenty, eighty, seventy, forty. Write down a piece of furniture. 62, 622, 87, 899, 922, 37, 462, 55, 83, 46, 22. Write down the name of a genius. 65, 422, 37, 888. Put your pens down. <laughs> now, by the way, I read that much more slowly than I normally do. <laughs> 
So who thinks they had all of the numbers correct? <laughs> well, the reality is we will never know because I was reading from a blank sheet of paper. I was making up all of the numbers. I want everybody to stand up. If when I asked you to write down a color, you didn't write anything down, or you wrote down red, blue, green, or yellow, please take a seat. All right, we lost quite a few here. Very good. Uh, let's see. Uh, what's, uh, do we have any black or white thinkers? Black or white. Okay, take a seat if you had black or white. Good. Um, orange or brown? Orange or brown? Good. All right, excellent. Everybody stand back up. <laughs> if for the piece of furniture you wrote down sofa, chair, table, desk, or couch, please take a seat. Uh, if you wrote down bed, please take a seat. Yes, lose a few more. I guess at the end of the day, you just get a little tired, and the bed is the first thing you start thinking about. And we lost pretty much everyone. Okay, last one. Everybody stand up. For the genius, if you didn't write anything down or you wrote down Einstein, take a seat. <laughs> All right, let's see how honest you are right now. If you wrote down your own name or the word me, take a seat. Oh, man. That was awesome. <laughs> If you wrote down the name of someone you work with or maybe one of the speakers here today and you're sucking up to them, you can take a seat. <laughs> Woohoo! yes. And at this point, we won't go through them, but it's like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Tesla, whatever. So everybody just take a seat. The, the purpose of this exercise is to make a point, which is really important for us to get. The point is this. Expertise is the enemy of innovation. Expertise is the enemy of innovation. Here's the reality. The brain is not wired for success. The brain is not wired to do things better. The brain is not wired to improve. The brain is wired for one thing and pretty much one thing only, which is survival. Here's the rationale of the brain. You're sitting there in the chair today, and you're alive. That's good news. And you were alive yesterday and the day before and go back as many days as you want to till the day you were born. Now, you may think at some point that I could do something different that would make my life better, but here's what your brain is going to say. It's going to say, guess what? Everything we did up to this point kept us alive. Therefore, doing something different might seem like a good idea, but it's risky. So we're going to repeat the past. Our natural inclination is to repeat the past. And so think about this exercise for a moment. What happens is when you think about something a lot or for a long period of time, we will build these neural pathways in the brain, these grooves in the brain. There are, there are things which allow us to very quickly recall things that are important. And so if you think about the colors, red, blue, green, and yellow, these are the primary colors of paint and light. These are the colors we were typically taught as a kid. Therefore, when asked to recall something, we will naturally recall that. We will always recall things that we've thought about a lot. So if we're an expert and we spend our life in a company or in a particular career or a particular major, that's what we're going to know a lot of, and it's going to be difficult for us to see the world differently. We repeat the past much more readily than we will about inventing new futures. So if we understand this, and we understand the fact that the the brain would rather just perpetuate what it's done before, because again, it's a survival thing. If we took the time to think about it and change, especially when we're under stress, the whole purpose of that exercise was to stress you out a little bit, and you saw that 95% of the people came up with pretty much the same answers. I'm curious by a show of hands, how many of you had Einstein sitting in a blue or red chair? Just by a show of hands. Now just, just take a look around. I mean, that is a, you know, maybe 10%, whatever the number is, that is a ridiculously large number of people who came up with exactly the same answer. So we think we're being creative, but the problem is we'll come up with a new idea and we'll stop looking. 
So you as a human being, you've designed your life a particular way, you will live that life, and therefore it's difficult for you to define it differently. So what do we do? One of the things we do is we start to study other people. If we're not successful, let's study successful people and see what we can learn from them. And that's what I want to talk about now. I have, for the past seven years, been doing a massive study of 1,200 very successful individuals from a wide range of businesses and lives and geographies. And after this seven-year study, we have distilled down what we really believe to be the five key traits of all successful people. We studied 1,200 of them, and this was, these were the five traits that were common amongst all of them. So to just demonstrate, I chose five people who are successful, four of the speakers and Gareth, who is our photographer. Uh, I've, I've, I, they don't know what they're going to do other than they're going to see the list of five things, and I'm just going to show them, and then we'll have a little conversation. So if the five uh, people can come up. Yes, give them a hand. Woohoo! <laughs> All right, so I've got the list of the five things that will make people successful. I want you to look at the list, and I want you to ask yourself, how many of these five do you actually live? How many of these five do you actually do? All right? Alex. Five. All five? Five. Four. Four. We'll come back to which one, okay? Five. Five? Five. Five. Excellent. Okay. Good. I'll take those sheets of paper. I'm going to talk to you later. <laughs> <laughs> But as you can see, this gives us a sense that at least five successful people had five all through. Maybe you're not as successful as we think you are. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm going to ask all of you to just to take a seat. Thank you very much. Please thank them. Now, you're probably wondering, what are the five traits of successful people? Here they are. So we found that successful people have a computer, they have a mobile phone, they, they brush their teeth, they, they shower most days, and my guess is, because I know there are some people who uh, want to always work in their underwear, that's sort of like a goal for a lot of people, but we found that most people tend to, if they're going into the office, would wear clothes. Now this is obviously a little silly. But there's an important point to this. There is something which researchers fail to understand, which is something called the undersampling of failure. The undersampling of failure basically means what we do in almost every research project in the world is we study the people who are successful at doing something. And we try to find the common traits, but we don't study the people who were not successful. And let's face it, we can look at, for example, we take a Facebook. Look, Facebook was successful, and people have tried to replicate Facebook. And what people still do is they study Facebook to understand what do they do and how do they do it. The reality is for every Facebook, there are 10,000 failures. But we don't study those failures. Part of the reason we don't study the failures is because we don't even know who they are. So it's really important any time that you're listening to a speaker, like me, any time you read a book, any time you talk with one of your friends. I'm going to give you what I think is my single best piece of advice. My best piece of advice is to ignore all advice. Now, obviously, I don't mean this in its exactness. I don't mean, of course, don't listen to anything. There is a lot to learn, but there's two filters I want you to use anytime somebody gives you an advice. Anytime you read a book, sometimes a friend gives you their advice, two questions that you have to ask. Question number one. Question number one you want to ask yourself is, does this really seem to be the cause of their success? Now, there's a lot of situations where we have things which are related or they're purely coincidence. And so you need to start thinking about, very critically, about all advice that you're given. Because if you don't, you're going to start implementing bad advice. You know, I remember uh, I was attending this conference and a very, very well-known author, an author you would probably all know, was up there and he said, I'm going to give you 
my best piece of advice for marketing a book. He said, get your face, a picture of your face on the cover of a major magazine. And I thought, wow, that's brilliant advice. Totally delusional, but it's brilliant advice. This is the problem with advice. People don't know what made them successful. Even researchers don't know what made people successful. But even if they did, even if they did, I want you to recognize the fact that what would work for one person, even if it would work for you, may not be how you want to live your life. You need to ask yourself, is this how I want to live? Because every person's different. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. And all the research in the world and all the advice and all the books and all the speeches can give you whatever advice they want. Most of the time it's contradictory advice, which then has to have you ask yourself, what is really the essence of what we need to learn when we come to conferences like this? How do we distinguish the good stuff from the bad stuff, and how do we then figure out what is best for my life? For example, my life is designed a very specific way. I get advice from other professional speakers all the time. They tell me how I can grow my business and make more money, and the reality is I have one measure of success for my business. My measure of success is how many countries I get to speak in. I've spoken in 44 countries to date, Yesterday, I just booked number 45. This, to me, is my measure of success because all I care about is being able to meet new people in new places. And all the other advice that I get from people, although it might be well-intentioned, is not useful for me. Now, having said all that, there is some things that I found to be extremely powerful when it comes to success, when it comes to fast success, and when it comes to actually living a very powerful, purposeful life life. And I'll tell a story from some work uh, that I was involved with many years ago. Uh, when I lived in England uh, back around 2000, I worked for a Formula One team. And this was just a, a great experience. As an American, I had no idea what Formula One was, but it was still a really interesting thing. And what I love about Formula One or any race cars more than anything else, it's not the, it's not the cars, it's not the drivers. It's actually the pit crews. The pit crews I just find so fascinating. And back when I worked with them, there were 20 people in a Formula One pit crew, 20 people, and they would basically be fueling the car, changing the tires, changing the aerodynamics, doing minor maintenance in just a matter of seconds. I mean, you've seen these things split second. The way they get a pit crew to go fast is they will sit there with a stopwatch, and they will time them, and they will do this over and over and over and they will keep on practicing the movements of changing the tires, fueling the car, doing the maintenance, until there is a point that no matter what they do, no matter how hard they try, no matter what they do to motivate them, they can't shave off one one-thousandth of a second. This is the absolute fastest time. Now, they've tried things like bribing them, giving them more money, or giving them status, or whatever. Like, none of those things worked. There was a point, no matter what they did, they couldn't go one one-thousandth of a second faster. The pit crew boss decided to try something very interesting. And basically what he decided to try was, he told the pit crew members that instead of being evaluated on their speed, they were going to be evaluated on their style. They were to go fast, but they weren't supposed to focus on the stopwatch, they were to focus on their movement. So if they were changing the tires, they were to think smooth. Fueling the car, think smooth. And as they went through this process of not focusing on the speed, but focusing on the style, the pit crew was able to consistently, consistently shave off two-tenths to three-tenths of a second, which is a very large amount of time for a pit crew. And when we asked the pit crew members if they were going faster or slower, everyone on the pit crew thought they were going slower. I call this the performance paradox. What we need to get is that the more we focus on the measures, the goals, the KPIs, and I know that here in Denmark, there is a movement towards measuring everything. Now, as a manager, I would recommend against that, but as an individual, sometimes you don't have a choice. So the thing that I want you to think about is possibly the way to improve your speed and your success is actually to not focus on what you want. 
So instead of focusing on the outcome in the future, you focus on something that you can do in the present moment. So for example, we did a study in a retail store where they were selling clothing. And we did a competition. And in the competition, they had two teams. One team was measured the traditional way. How much do we sell? And the, the person who sold the most would get a bonus, get their names and lights in the newsletter, all that great stuff. The second team was measured purely on how well they served the customer. How much they sold was completely irrelevant to their measure of success. And this went on for a while, and in the end, what we found was that the team measured on how well they served the customers consistently, consistently sold more than the people who were focused on trying to sell to the customer. Again, the sale is the future. Serving someone is the present moment. So anytime you're working on something, think about what is a present moment activity that I can do that will raise my ability to ultimately achieve the outcome I want, but I don't start with the outcome, I actually start with the present moment. In many cases, it's gonna be of a higher purpose. How do I serve someone? Or how do I be present to what's going on? So in the world of creativity, which is where I spend you know, all my time, uh, one of the things that we look at is how measures destroy creativity. The more you measure how creative an organization is, the less creative the organization actually is. And we've proven this, and look, here's the thing we know. Think about it for a moment. Do you get your most creative ideas when you are sitting in a cubicle with your boss standing over your shoulder? Probably not. When do you get your best ideas? For me, it's when I'm sitting in a hot tub. But it could be for you, it could be for yoga, it could be meditation, it could be in the shower. You know, it's, it's, it's claimed that Aristotle would actually go to bed, lay down on the bed, put a brass plate in his chest, he would hold a brass ball over his hand, and as he fell asleep, he'd drop the brass ball, it would hit the plate, it would wake him up. And that's when he got some of his best inspiration. So we did a couple of experiments where we actually took people and spent what would be considered unproductive time before the workday, and we took them on a 30-minute meditation retreat. And the measure of success was how many new patent ideas could they develop over a course of a period of time. And they were able to improve it by two to three-fold margin by actually taking time out of the day to relax. So look for yourself at like how much time are you spending stressed out? How stressed out is your organization? How do you reduce the stress? How do you get focused on something that will actually help you be more present moment focused? So we heard earlier that uh, one of the books that I wrote is called Goal Free Living. Goal Free Living is the philosophy that we do our best work when we're not focused on our goals but we are actually sort of in that present moment. And one of the really cool things is I had an opportunity uh, during that is I drove in my car, hopped in my car, and I drove 20,000 uh, 20, kilometers. I drove 20,000 kilometers over 90 days. And I interviewed about 150 really creative people, and what I found was the most creative people were the people who didn't obsess about the future but they were always focused on what do I do today? What's the best work I can do right now? And one of the guys that I really, this guy to me was just sort of the, the creme de la creme, the person who I met that I thought was the most interesting. His name is Doug Bush. Doug at the time was the chief information officer for Intel. So important guy in an important company reporting into the CEO. And he shared with me a bunch of very fascinating things in terms of how he lived his life. But one thing always sticks with me. He told me that when he was trying to do a good job at work, he would do a good job. I mean, he's a competent guy, he would do a good job. When he didn't worry about losing his job, he did better work. And he says his best work always came when he'd go into the CEO's office and say, the best thing you can do is fire me. When we get so attached to that outcome, we will automatically create stress, which kills our creativity. There is a part of the brain called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and that's a part of the brain which is the judgmental part. It's the part that thinks. And when that part is activated, it will literally crush the neural pathways to the parts of the brain where you are creative and inspired and passionate. It's why athletes choke. I mean, when they talk about choking, it is a literal thing. As they start to think about a putt, for example, they are 
shutting off the neural pathways to particular parts of the brain that will prevent them from thinking. So what we need to understand from all of the things that I'm talking about here is that sometimes we don't want to be focused on the past and we don't want to be focused on the future. If I focus on the future, I'm...